Hi everyone, and thank you very much for joining us today. And our sincere apologies to all those of you who had problems accessing us uh, last week. Uh, regrettable, but hopefully we'll make up for it this week. Um, I'm Roger Beattie from COPC, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to our webinar on the subject of work at home. Probably the most talked about subject of the year to date. Um, very interesting topic as this is too. Before I introduce our speaker for today, um, and for the benefit of those who are new to COPC, I want to take just a minute just to give you a brief overview of who we are and, and what we do. Um, COPC was founded 25 years ago, or nearly 25 years ago, and is now internationally recognized as, as a global leader in the world of customer experience. We provide consulting, certification, and management, management training services in multiple languages to our clients across more than 70 countries. We're perhaps best known for the COPC family of CX standards, which, if you're not familiar with, you're welcome to download free of charge from our website at uh, www.copc.com. Um, at the end of today's webinar, we'll be having a Q&A session. So if you have any questions you would like to ask, You'll see at the bottom of your screen, there's a Q&D button. If you press that and type in your question, we'll include it in the questions we have at the end. We would also ask you to complete a short survey, um, giving us feedback on what you think of today's event. Like you, we want to continuously improve and to do so, we need your feedback. So please tell us what you think and uh, we'll use it in future, future events. Now, I'm delighted to hand over to our, uh, our speaker for today, uh, my colleague, Kevin Campbell, Managing Director of COPC in Europe, Middle East and Africa. Kevin, over to you. Thank you, Roger. And welcome everyone for, to today's webinar. As Roger mentioned, that uh, work at home uh, is one of the biggest um, topics in our industry at the moment. Um, and probably for the last three, four months, um, has been a much bigger focus than we could all imagine uh, at the start of the year. Um, however, it has been something that's been in place for quite some time, maybe not as aggressively as it is right now. So what we're going to just have it start off with talking about is the types of environments and what we see in terms of from COPC's point of view when it comes to work from home, uh, and then goes into talking about performance and actually the impact of work at home on our performance or performance management of our staff and making sure that our staff are as efficient as we possibly can. Obviously, efficiency is a big driver for all of us because it drives our cost. Um, but it also um, impacts the way that we plan and actually deliver service to our clients. To understand what type of environments people are running and, and how much of a change has happened um, in the last few months, COPC carried out a, a, a survey of the industry looking at 76 respondents across 50 different countries with, organ with locations as small as 100 seats all the way up to 100,000 seats around the world, just to get some feedback of what's actually out there in the market and what we're experiencing. Now, the results became back very interesting. And it was interesting because it was really demonstrated the transition that we've had to make to work at home. And when I look at the results here from the current performance, um, compared to before COVID-19 and the percentage of staff that were actually working from home, well, there was only 3% of those organisations that had 100% of their staff working from home. Well, 67% of them had 0% of staff working from home. Now, as you can see by the red here, there's been quite some transition here. And some of you will be sitting here saying that I'm definitely up at the 100% uh, and some of you say, well, due because of the type of business that we've had to run in terms of in governance and, and security wise, we weren't able to have as many staff working from home as we, we, we'd like during the COVID period. But this is quite a big change, you know, moving from 3% of centres with 100% work at home to 28% with 100% working at home. Now, this is a real test of how good your processes were and how good your organization is at managing change. And the interesting thing about change in this instance is, was it more of a crisis mode rather than a change management process? And it's amazing how much work we've managed to do to get people working from home. 
but is this a solution that's going to work for us long term and is it robust enough to actually have us um, provide an effective um, an efficient solution long term the industry one of the other interesting things that we saw was how big a difference it was for our organizations in terms of some organizations as you can see from the, the slide here when we ask whether or not the demand in the volumes and how busy you are where was it getting busier or was it quieter so you can see that 47 percent of the organizations we spoke to actually got busier through the covid period now some of those may have some travel um, industries and may have started off being very busy where people were cancelling or moving or changing bookings and then became very quiet or it could be some specific types of business which like um, the uh, banking industry which obviously has a, had a huge increase of, uh, in volumes with people concerned about their financial situations so as 47 percent of these organizations were finding themselves getting busier during this period considering how many people have been transitioned into working from home 33 percent of the centers are less busy so uh, you know speaking to people at the very beginning of this there was a big ceremony do we actually um, have a huge volume of work for people to do? And the reality is, depending on the very type of business that you're running, had a huge impact on whether or not you were actually finding yourself that you had higher volumes and therefore trying to stretch your already stretched resource for working from home or trying to actually reduce the volume of um, staffing or changing the, the, the amount of work that people had to do for those um, organizations where volumes actually decreased. So we can see that there's not one rule that fits for everyone. Some got busier, some got quieter, some, as you say, 20% saw no change. But the difference is how we're actually servicing the customers and transitioning people from um, their operations into working at home. We asked what was the biggest concern for organizations? And we asked whether or not, as you can see, you know, what is the biggest concern and the largest concern was privacy concerns or governance or regulations. How do we protect ourselves as a company protecting the customer's details? This can be a huge challenge when we talk about working at home. And quite often organizations have to go through the technology route of limiting the access that staff have. We'll talk about that later. Or the highly sensitive business is actually kept in the office which raises other concerns, especially during a pandemic like we've had, just had. The interesting thing that the biggest concerns people seem to focus on was really about technology, privacy, touch on, on do our staff actually have a suitable workspace? And then it goes into how do we manage the performance? And it's really interesting that only 3% had saw quality as being their biggest challenge. Now that comes back to the question of all of us, do we feel that we currently in, the, in our office environment provided really high levels of quality and high levels of control of quality? And if you say, could say yes, then I can see why it'd be less of a concern. The difference is changing that process to ensure that it still happens from working at home is quite an interesting process it's, itself. We also started asking what was the smallest challenge that people had now as you can see from here is the staff's willingness to actually work from home was the smallest challenge which is quite an interesting one right now because during the pandemic you know everyone has been more flexible being um, supportive of the organizations they work for and understanding and trying to actually be a um, to, to give the option to work from home. And a lot of organizations are do, supporting, obviously, their, their, their staff doing that. So. But willingness right now is one thing. The question is, will that last? There's many case studies that you can look at. And there's a, a case study by a company called C-Trip. And they went for to roll out work at home. And like this, there was lots of staff who were willing to try and work from home. And it was the least of their concerns. 
But what they found was they had to move at least half of the people that had started working at home back into the office because of poor performance, because of the, the, the feeling that they were not supported and, uh, and had the structure to actually deliver on, on a daily basis. Well, when they finished the trial, they actually had um, three, um, two thirds of those people on the trial saying that they actually wanted to come back into the office due to loneliness, et cetera, et cetera. Now, that's only one case study, and we know that it's very different in different locations and types of business that we have. And, and, and in this situation, we've got to think to ourselves is where we are today and the staff that we have right now, if we ask them if they want to come back into the, to, into the office, how many would actually come? That's quite a, 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 a question mark for the future, and we'll touch on that in, in a moment. Because one of the big questions that you've got to consider is, the working at home model that you have today, if you have a working at home model, will it be the same in the future or are you going to adjust? Because if you adjust them, it will change the process and how you actually manage your business and manage your staff. So right now we're sort of in, you know, a lot of organizations are in business co continuity response, meaning we've got had a pandemic, we've tried to get as many staff at working from home, Usually that's because they, and they're working very close to the hub, meaning the office itself. So close to hub staff who have been hired because they're in some, that, that area. Um, they're sitting there. They've been working there for two, three months, possibly now, maybe longer, depending on, on, on the situation in your country. And probably a small amount have still been in the office because maybe they haven't had the physical um, space to work from home or that you've actually had a high um, level of security on some of the, the products and services that you've run. Is that your future? Are we going to continue with this model? Or will it change? Will we evolve the model? Are we going to have a situation where people revoke, come to the hub? More people still return to the hub, but we still keep a large percentage of staff working from home or part-time working from home. The beauty of work at home is not only are we looking able to hire people close to the hub, but there is the next step to evolve into. Do we adopt the working at home model, allowing us to expand our recruitment and our, our um, working environment? Do we need people close to the hub? Do we actually start looking geog uh, to the greater geography of your location or, the, or, the, or, or as you can see behind me, the world? Do people actually need to work in the same country as you are to deliver service for your customers? That will raise, that point rate will raise lots of different security issues and, and discussion points, but it is logically possible. The next thing you can think about is do you actually, are you, your, is your work at home gonna be a complete transition? Are you removing the hub completely and therefore having everyone working from home? Whether they are local to where the hub used to be, your traditional staff model, or whether or not you're going to expand it over the geography. The interesting thing is you may actually change to something that has a mixture. We have some people who are 100% working from home, some people working from the hub, and some people actually having a mixture of going to the hub once per day, once per week, once per month, depending. And what that means is your processes will need to be different. How you manage and control the staff and um, support them will be very different depending on the type of person that you have and the type of working at home model that you're experiencing. So just to make sure that we understand this, do you expect your staff if you're working from home to be close to hub staff, so we're hiring, we're training, they're close to our brick and mortar facility, our hub, our best performers are, are, are able to work from home possibly. The agents can return to, to the hub to actually get coaching, meeting and socialize. Or are you actually going to look at the geography distributed model, which means the agents can work from anywhere. The hiring, the training and the management is done virtually. And the business continuity advantage, advantages to, to, um, is there to dis disperse your work across the, the, the environment. 
that you're looking at the whether it be geography and within your country within the within your region etc cetera, etc cetera. i think we've all had experiences where we've struggled to try um, hire or um, people within our specific area the geography and um, dispersed uh, model um, actually allows us to actually increase our recruitment area but it also means that we have to have robust virtual processes to support that staff. Anyone who has been involved in virtual training will know that it's very different from what we would not traditionally deliver on site. It means that we, we may not be able to do as long hours on Zoom, for example, like we are just now, um, we may have to look at different strategies and that's where why the, the models that, and processes that you had before may not fit perfectly and may need to be have major um, uh, adaption to make, fit your working at home model depending on the style of staff that you have. Remember, we're not saying that you need to have either closed to have or geographically distributed staff. You can have a mixture of both. But both need us to understand how we manage and how we control and how we support our staff during that, um, whichever model you choose. Now, let's talk about the performance management piece. I mentioned earlier, if you had strong process for your performance management, then adapting that to virtual world via working at home should have been a lot easier. If you have less structure and rely on supervisors or, or team leaders to design your performance management process, what you may have found is that as people um, move to work at home, is that you saw a huge variation in how people were supported or managed, and therefore that can increase our performance. Speaking to organizations, we're hearing things like and well, seeing the results as well of utilization going down, average hand time going up from working at home environments. How is that possible? The processes are exactly the same, possibly as they had before. What's different now? And it could be as simple as not having a, a strong management process to support and, <clears throat> and um, help the staff. Before the COVID-19 situation, <clears throat> I'm sure that most of your staff, if we said you can work from home, would have been quite interested in it. In normal times, the concept of working from home does appeal, doesn't it? As someone who travels a lot, actually, I'm, I'm, I'm now getting to the point where I'm thinking it appealed to start off with, being at home for a couple of days, a couple of weeks, a month. But actually working from home isn't as easy as I thought it would be. Now, I'm lucky I have Zoom calls virtually all hours of every day, which is pretty much most of you will be the same, whether it be Zoom, WebEx, whatever it may be, Teams. But the reality is that although we're having, we're having that interactions where we see people and talk to people, a lot of our staff are not having that same interactions. So the benefits where they thought, right, it's going to be brilliant, I'm not going to have any commuting times, I'm going to have more freedom. Well, now I'm sitting in my possibly office, if they're lucky, their living rooms, their bedrooms, uh, their flats being quite small in, in a lot of cases, sharing environments, and I'm eating, I'm sleeping, I'm working, all in the same environment and having to socialise. Well, going to the office, I had a different environment. It was very separate, my work and life was very separate and my socializing between the two actually varied working from home you require to have a much more robust and strong structure to how you work strong discipline and self-discipline which i'm sure at the level of people that are on this call most of you feel that you have a, le a good level of self-discipline but I'm always guarantee, although I can't see your faces, there are a few people here smiling, agreeing with me that maybe we don't have the same self-discipline that we thought we had when it comes to working from home. Now think about the staff that you have who are working from home. How many of them actually have that self-discipline? Of them, often, 
a lot of our staff are of a younger age where self-discipline may not be the strongest um, point. And maybe now that uh, we're getting to that point of working at home, how do we support them to, to be disciplined, to meet our requirements, to follow the rules? We don't have the ability to go tap someone on the shoulder, check if they're okay. It now all has to look at how strong our processes are virtually. Now, I mentioned about the environment that people are in. What sort of environment should it be? Should it look, or what would the environment should look like? You know, I'm sitting, I'm lucky, I have an office. I, I have a, a lovely door I can shut, shut away my children, um, et cetera, et cetera. I have a large enough desk. I've got multiple screens here. I've got the right head, um, I've got nice headsets here for when I'm on long calls. And as you can see, I've got a webcam. So I can have face-to-face in -face interactions with my staff, but also my clients. This is a nice environment to work on. The question being is, is that the environment that all of your staff have? Let's talk about what it shouldn't contain. I'm sure a few of you may actually relate to this happening as well, is that you know, children haven't been at school. So how do you support your children? You have your pets. Now I'll be the first to admit I have a lovely little dog and, uh, and trying to keep the dog out of my office is a big challenge. <laughs> but I know if the dog is here right now, be trying to distract me. That is that the suitable solution for your staff? Is that stress-free? Is that a good solution for actually delivering good customer service? Now, the interesting thing is quite often organizations at the moment have, have been telling their clients, we have people working from home, there might be some background noise. The question that we've got to ask are, uh, is, our customers are accepting noise now. But is that an exception? Is that because it's an exceptional time or is that something that we're going to um, live with for a long time? Now, although we want to protect, protect our, our customers, we also have to think about protecting our staff and having someone lying on their bed trying to take calls to customers is not a long-term solution. And I know that ha that is happening now, whether it's happening in your organization or not, we're seeing lots of companies and speaking to lots of people who have that situation. Traditionally, the people who are agents may um, not have the, the living environments where they will have, like I mentioned, a nice office, lots of space, quiet space, shut the door, things like that. It's down to us to make sure that our staff are able to work effectively at home. Now, if they have a great working environment, step one, Easy, we've got that sorted. But what we've got to think about is, I mentioned the team leaders or supervisors now have a, a different role. Now, the team lead leader or, or supervisor role varies in organizations that we visit across the world. Some are targeted at managing agent staff and that's all they do. Some are targeted at doing projects and a little bit of staff management. But when someone is working at home, you do not have the visibility or traditionally you don't have the visibility and control that you have in the office. So therefore that performance management piece and the individual coaching and support becomes a much larger percentage of the supervisors or team leaders role. And one of the things that we've got to think about when we're focusing on our supervisors and team leaders is what does their day look like? What should they consider? Here's an example of a structure day. Because one thing from working at home is communicate, communicate, communicate is, or is something we have to do. So it's all about starting with a communication. Now, some may on this call might go in, Kevin's saying a 50 minute daily huddle, virtual huddle, that's gonna affect my utilization. And it doesn't have to be 15 minutes per day, but it's about making sure that everyone understands what happened the previous day, what the performance plans are, what's gonna to happen today. How do we actually uh, drive our business from our supervisor level? 
how do we actually think about the process of having feedback to our staff remotely? Is it an email? Well, I must put my hand up and say, I don't read all my emails in detail. So if I only send an email out to a, a, an agent, the chances of them actually reading it and making sure that they understand it without some sort of follow-up is pretty weak. So we need to find a way of actually giving feedback, whether it be a video call or a chat session, something that gives us a two-way communication that, um, between the supervisor and the staff themselves. And with the words that are written here are effective coaching. Not just telling people you need to get better, but giving advice and support of how to get better. Understanding what the problems are. Because the problems might not be the ability to follow the process to handle the customer. It could be external factors that we just mentioned the working environment may not be suitable for actually dealing with its customers. Or there's something else going on in the house or in the um, property which is actually affecting the ability to deliver the service. Then is about recognition, knowing that you, that you matter, knowing that you're actually getting feedback about things that have gone well. We can't go up and say, well done in person in front of a group of people. So virtually we need to actually do some team recognition. How do your supervisors handle that? How does your management staff handle that? I mentioned earlier, communication, communication, communication. Well, there's different levels of that, as we all know. But having a process where we can actually speak to the staff is, as an individual, as a team, and give them some feedback about the wider operation, not just their performance, the team's performance, the uh, um, business performance, and the company's performance. One of the big things that we, we are aware of at the moment is that not all companies are doing well and that can raise concerns with your staff and being able to communicate and give them clear answer and honest answers and information of what's happening in the organization can settle some concerns and drive performance but that frequent co um, connects with the team whether it be through a team chat room which we see quite often also helps us establish some support mechanisms for things like escalations or if they need help i have a problem i have a question that frequent connects actually is a huge um, influence on how the staff can deliver effectively the final thing and if you remember back to the survey there was comments about is our quality a concern well, actually, because you're not walking past, you're not hearing people um, working, you're not seeing as much of the transactions or, um, or hearing the transactions that you may have possibly done before, the idea of doing remote observations is even more important. You won't be able to do side-by-side -side monitoring. It's very difficult. Unless you've, unless you've got an organisation where you can travel around people's uh, homes and sit down with them. So what you've got to think about is, and what we've seen, not just through the, the, the recent period, but when we've worked with work at home organizations in the past, is whatever you're doing in terms of transaction monitoring to, today in hub, you should think that maybe you need to double it for when you're looking at working at home. And it doesn't need to be that they are actually filling in lots of forms, increasing a sample size, it's more about supporting and coaching the staff. So focus on how do you actually increase your remote observations, feedback on an ongoing basis. So they know they're supported. They know that they're there, that you are there as a supervisor or team leader to actually deliver for them, giving them feedback. Because sitting on your own in a room, in your own house, there is the ability to be a little bit more relaxed, a little bit more unfocused on the process itself. And what we want to do is continue to drive the same level of quality or improve the level of quality that we delivered previously. Now, you won't be sh shocked that someone from COPC likes an action plan because we like to see um, people improving. But from all of that information, we should be helping this, uh, to develop some sort of plan to help each individual to actually achieve their goals. But the supervisor needs to have that structure. 
So one of the questions that you've got to ask yourself is, are my supervisors, do they have a structured plan for the day? Do they know what they're going to do, when and how they're going to do it? Or are they got a to-do list that they draw up every morning and try and do it? We tr traditionally um, encourage supervisors, specifically when work at home begins, to actually create a structure, create a rhythm, create a schedule for people to get some familiarity of what's going to happen, when it's going to happen, so that they get the support and comfort that there is a routine and that there is a form of discipline. So having a daily plan for your supervisors and team leaders is one of the key steps to actually ensure that your, the support is there for your staff. I mentioned earlier as well that we understand that things aren't going to be smoothly. And what we're seeing is lots of organizations are finding that their staff are not as efficient as they once were when they were in the hub. So if I show you this as an example, what can I, we're seeing as performance and what should happen? We see people moving to working from home. And what we see is that there's a huge focus on how do we deliver service? We, the first thing we've got to do is deliver service. That's our focus. So we need the technology in place. We're going to make sure the staff understand that they have to juggle, they're working at home, they're um, homeschooling, and all of these things to actually allow us to deliver service. But immediately we saw an erratic performance, lots of variation in performance between the agents, between the days of, um, that, we were, um, that we were servicing. And anyone who's been involved in operations know that we do not want lots of variation. We want to have control. So once we have sort of moving out the current stage, and this is kind of where we are right now, operations set realistic targets, trying to actually say, well, we know that we've got lots of variation, but we want to put some level of controls in there. We've already delivered on the basic needs that we need to meet. Now we introduce our plan. Plan their day, give them some structure. Now we can start reducing the variation and start looking at controls. And as we move from that phase, we can put more tight restrictions and targets as our performance starts to improve. And we can focus more, not just on just delivering service, but delivering high levels of, of customer experience, reducing our variation. And then we begin to drive performance to shift the mean in the direction that we're looking for. Now, this example is sort of giving you an idea of things like utilization going up. Obviously, if it was like things like AHT, we may want to reduce the, vari the variation and the AHT going down. But it's about trying to reduce that variation and have more control. If you feel that you're looking at the left-hand side of this slide, and that's where you are today, think about how much control and how much structure you have in the management of your staff. And why is there such variation? From day to day, you might find variation because of the type of calls that you're receiving. But is that any different from before, before people went from, to work at home? So we would rec highly recommend that you start looking at the variation and manage your variation within your organization. A few more things that we want to just discuss today is saying it is really going through a couple of topics that you've got to ask yourself. And what we see is strong organizations have strong processes for the following. One, what are your procedures? How good are your procedures? I'll touch on that in a second in more detail. How do you support for ex uh, exceptions? How good is your escalation process? In an office, if I want to escalate, I'm putting my hand up or I'm standing up, I'm walking over. That's not necessarily possible in a working at home environment. How good is your, your dashboards? How well do your staff see performance? I walk into lots of organizations and they have lovely screens up on the boards. And they, I look at the screen and I know exactly what performance is at any time. 
I've got lots of organizations that have dynamic dashboards where they can see the performance all the time. But I also walk into lots of organizations where a piece of paper is stuck to a board once every two weeks. That solution doesn't work when it comes to working at home. We need people to actually see the performance. And then finally, in this circle, how good is your knowledge base? How effective is it? Well, let's go through those. Specifically, when I'm going to touch on this period, because it's a really important period. But when we look at things like COVID, and I look at my documents, um, and my pro um, sorry, my procedures, how well were they defined? Were they strong? Were they able to achieve our customers' needs? So how good are your service journeys? Whether it be your full service journeys or the element that you control. There's some um, further webinars on service journeys coming up from COPC, which you're more than welcome to attend or attend our, our training. But well, think about it in terms of your processes. If you think about a telecoms um, company who is selling products in the retail environment and all of a sudden the retail store shut, um, closed, how good were the processes and our staff able to handle those changes in those processes? How clear was that to our staff moving to working at home environments? I mentioned the raising the, the, the hand. You know, I can't walk over to someone. So do we actually have some virtual floor walkers or as I said before, a network of support from other staff where if I don't know the answer, I can actually ask the question. And as you start hiring people from working at home, we understand that people who, um, work, um, <clears throat> who come onto the floor will have more questions as they leave training. So how do we support them? And if you don't have a strong process for that, it's necessary for you to do that because if you expand your working at home from now, even through natural attrition, you're going to have to hire people and therefore you're going to have to have the concern of how do we get them efficient and effective on the floor. <clears throat> then we think about our escalation process. Do we actually take over transactions and therefore now we have an escalation uh, transfer um, from one department to another? Or is there a way that for staff to actually get support and be educated about certain situations for customers? I touched on the um, dynamic dashboards in terms of how do they see their team stats. I think that's quite self-explanatory. But I think right now is one of the, the key eight times where we're actually seeing people realize the importance of knowledge bases. How good is your knowledge base? And notice it says internal and external here. Maybe you, if you've got an external um, knowledge base where your actual um, clients um, can actually um, review it or your customers uh, review it uh, and therefore reduce the volume of transactions coming into you. But how good are the, the knowledge bases that are managed giving um, information to your staff? How accurate, how updated are they? How do we check the knowledge of the staff against the knowledge base so that they're giving the right answers at the right time? I think I could do another webinar on knowledge bases, so I'm not going to spend too much more time on it, but just the understanding that how effective is it? Because now I can't walk over to a friend. I can't ask my, my colleague um, sitting next to me unless you have a virtual ability to do that as a team and put things on chat rooms. Now, the concern with chat is do you put it as a big room or do you do it one to one as an individual? And quite often staff, especially experienced staff, don't want to be show, showing themselves up of a lack of knowledge. So don't always put the questions on there. So it's something that we have to consider. But a robust knowledge base is key to make sure that we have the quality of information given to the customer and making sure it's the right information, the most up to date information, managing your change of, of your business. And we change a lot in our business. And I don't think that that will change, that, that there'll be any different. If not, we probably have more changes coming in in the next three, four months as our businesses have to adapt to the current situation. One last thing that I really want to just touch on as well is, well, second last thing, should I say, is 
the, the, the aim of having all this communication and communication is we can't underestimate <clears throat> the stress and anxiety issues that uh, people have working from home. It's a very difficult time in the world. We uh, we're all feel anxiety in different ways, but we want to make sure that we have a good structure where our staff are supported. Because if we don't have staff, we have a big problem. But we want to support them in every way we can. So making sure that your supervisors and your team leaders have a way of engaging with the staff. Not just assuming that everyone is okay, but just checking, listening to them. Well, this is a, an interesting concept for me standing, sitting here or speaking to, you know, virtually to myself in, 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 on the screen, but actually listening and understanding is key. Showing empathy, showing understanding of the situation. The difficulty is that actually trying to stay calm in these situations um, and also think about your own self-care, your supervisors, your team leaders. If they're not healthy and, and feel a, a supportive, both physically and mentally, then how do we actually um, support our, our, our agents? But one of the things that at the very bottom of the slide is also important to remind, remind your staff is during this time, how do we be flexible? Long term with our work at home, we also need to think about flexibility. And how do we actually get that flexibility both ways? It's not a one way thing anymore. It never really was. But <clears throat> when it comes to the situation when you're working at home and the restrictions that you may have, it is not just a one th way thing. Finally, and for those people on the call that know me, will know that workforce management is one of my favorite subtopics. But when I look at thinking about maximizing what we have with our staff and understanding the flexibility that we have to show our staff. Working at home, especially as we move from the office staff out to working at home, and if we're going to keep them there, then we have to think to ourselves, was, now we have to look at our, our, our scheduling opportunities. Does everyone still want to work a nine to five? Or can they work a nine to five? Is it a, a, do we have more options about how we actually match our staff to our arrival patterns of work? Because staff now have other home commitments they have. They may have the childcare may change. They may have um, their partners working from home and only having one working space. So can you be flexible between the, uh, the two uh, people working from home? But this is a perfect time to go out there and optimize your staff. Optimize the work um, um, uh, opportunities or working flex flexibility, the start and stop times for shifts, the lengths of shifts, how many hours they want to work, the breaks. You know, you can increase the breaks and re or um, reduce the breaks depending on your know, working rules um, or legal requirements, but also in line with what works for the staff working from home and the arrival patterns and they're be for becoming much more efficient. Okay. So, one last eight thing we've got to come back to is thinking about everything we've just discussed. What is your, your, your working at home landscape going to look at post COVID-19? Are we going to continue where we are today with few people working from the hub and the rest working remotely? Are we going to tr transition so some people are working from the hub half the time, some people are working full time at working at home, and we actually start having a small, a larger percentage working in the hub, but most people working from the home? Are we going to expand our working at home to a, a, a larger geography? Or are we going to go for the full transformation and completely working at home? Making that decision will affect how you actually design your processes for the things that we discussed previously. Last slide before we go to question and answers. And this is a very important, when you're assigning or deciding on which method or uh, approach you're going to use, think about these things. One, your service journeys. How effective are your service journeys to support your customers? Has there, how well are designed? 
has there any, been any failure points in your service journeys, which is restricted um, through channel restrictions? I mentioned the retail stores not being open as much as they were before. Is there anything that actually impacts the ability to deliver service as it was before? Cost to serve. It's a great idea. We, we, closed, the, we closed the offices. We, redu you know, we reduced the cost of real estate. But what we've got to think about is, is that practical to what we want to achieve? What is the cost per staff member, for example, for a work at home staff member, a HAB staff or a hybrid, someone working sometimes in the office and sometimes at home? And the infrastructure needed to support those staff. What is the cost of that? Hopefully you all have high end, high speed broadband, so it shouldn't be a problem. But as a company, do we have to pay for that? Do we have to pay for in different countries a, be a different structure of what I actually have to pay for as a company? Seat, table, computer screens, et cetera, et cetera. But also my um, te technology uh, situation in terms of how do I, what's the cost to actually support staff who are maybe spread across the whole country when a, a mouse doesn't work, what do I do? What is the cost implication for my technology? Think about your staffing. Do you want your, your recruitment to be close to the hub? Do you want to actually look at your staff profile? Are all of your staff suitable for working from home? If you remember back to my story at the very beginning that you know, two thirds of people wanted to come back to the office from that child that I mentioned because they were lone. Now that might be down to process design and it, or it might be down to the individual's profile. Then think about your performance management as we've been talking today. How good is it? How well designed is it to actually de deliver support? When it comes to business continuity, you can look at your what happens if you have an ISP outage. In the UK, Virgin had a major outage this week. If I had 90% of my staff on Virgin internet, then I, had a, I would have a major problem. Also thinking about business, I think everyone probably on this call has had a VPN problem at one point in their life. How good is it? How well is it able to support my staff? And the final two are really important. How do we protect our staff, the health and safety of them? Or if they come back into the office, even for a short time, the social distancing. And finally, the protection of our customers, the end users. Remember, do we want to have all of our work handled work at home? Do we actually want to bring in technology to limit the access to customers' details? Or do we actually bring in high risk transactions back into our business, into our hubs? Hopefully there's a few things in that we've discussed today that you, give you some room for thought. But I want to say thank you very much for listening to me so far. Um, we're going to open it up for questions and answers. And I'll hand you over to Roger for that. Thanks, Kevin. Um, I don't know about you guys, but I, I find that subject really fascinating. Um, I work for home, from home or work from home most of the time for over 15 years. And I do recognize a lot of the issues that have been talked about. Um, even I, who traveled perhaps one week in four, and the rest of the, the, the other three weeks were spent working from home. I I've, I've found lockdown difficult when you're not traveling at all. So my, my heart goes out to you guys, and particularly your agents who have perhaps moved back uh, working from home when they're, they're not in a perfect environment. So it is very, very difficult. Um, as promised, we're going to look at some questions. Uh, we haven't had a lot of questions coming in, but we had quite a lot last, last week. So I'm going to, to raise some of those questions because they, they, they seem to be really interesting ones. Uh, and I'll include some of the questions that you've raised today. Um, the first one, Kevin, is, is the learning curve of new staff longer than for uh, work at home staff? Well, it's an interesting question. And one of the things that you've got to consider to come back to what type of model that you're, you're, you're looking at. Um, if you're looking at a, a, a hybrid model where staff are actually trained and introduced into the programme within the office, and then as they get more experience and allowed to work from home, then you'll find that it's probably a quite a similar learning curve. But what's really important is to actually think about how your processes are to support staff if they are going to be trained 
um, from home. Um, <clears throat> the, I mentioned earlier about the escalation points and the support points and the floor walkers is even high, more important than in the office because you don't see when someone's struggling. Um, you only see it when there's a fail call or a repeat call or if you're doing transaction monitoring. So you need to rely on more and, and more robust support systems to ensure that your learning curve isn't any longer than it should be. Um, I've seen both situations where we've had work at home where it's been just similar to in the office, but we've also seen uh, instances where the work at home learning curve has actually increased because the support is not as, as strong as it would have been in the office. <clears throat> okay, thanks. Um, one's just come in, a really interesting one. Um, regarding, work in, regarding agent in, engagement, mm -hmm. how can you keep the team motivated to have a strong team bonding if most of the team members have never met before? Today it's okay um, because most of them know each other, but going down months and years uh, in advance with attrition, some of, some of the people will never ever meet the rest of the team members. And that's a, it's a sad situation that, uh, you know, hopefully we, we may not have the same level of attrition that we had in the past if we, if we do this right. But um, actually, I mentioned about the video cameras and, and, and actually having, um, you know, the movement of actually being able to see people through video cameras is actually make a, will make a big difference in, in having regular meetings. Now, if you're involved in a, a daily meeting or a daily huddle, for, even for 15 minutes, and team leader and supervisors trying to keep, um, you know, getting people engaged in those meetings, as well as having monthly meetings, uh, team meetings, um, and try and get people with that chat room. I mentioned about communication. If you've got a team chat room, getting people to be involved, if you're not hearing from someone for a long time, is getting staff to actually, or contact them directly on the chat room to get them to, to, to ask a question or respond is key. Um, uh, but the sad thing is that some of your colleagues may never meet uh, in the future. But on the other side of things, they may also be the best of friends in the future because they're communicating possibly more than they would do if they were in the office environment through the virtual um, support platform. Thanks. Um, okay, another one. How can we reduce the security risk of having people work at home? Well, I think that the, <clears throat> there's a couple of things that I sort of touched on in the, in the presentation. Uh, I don't think there's an easy answer. Um, uh, you know, I, I've joked about in the past having a security guard beh sitting behind an agent to make sure that they're not doing anything wrong, but that's not both financially, um, doesn't financially make sense. Um, but the reality is, how do you use technology to, to sort of reduce the risk? So how do you make sure that the, the right level of information is available to the work at home agent? How um, have we done a full risk assessment to identify what is high risk and what do, should we do back in the office because of the risk level? Uh, and what can we do at home? Um, some organizations that we visit make sure that the working environment by reviewing and going to the, the staff members premises to review what, it, what the working environment looks like and how they are actually protecting um, access to the information, um, but regular monitoring and checking compliance checks uh, is is one of your other stronger processes that you need to protect the customer's um, security. Thank you. Um, is there any clear indication yet of an impact of work at home on CSAT or NPS or any other measurement? Yeah, um, I think that there's long term from work at home, we, we you know, not talking about COVID, we saw um, some de information and there's, you know, there's case studies out there that, uh, that uh, it has no effect on, on customer satisfaction. The interesting thing over um, COVID period um, <clears throat> is I don't necessarily believe it's a, a true reflection on, on what um, work at home can do. Um, we're seeing lots of organizations, customer satisfaction going down or lots of organizations having less focus on customer satisfaction. But I believe that a lot of that is about the, um, the transition to work at home and having uh, as, a, uh, as a crisis mode of just trying to deliver service and get service up and running. Uh, and it may not be a true picture that work at home actually decreases customer satisfaction. Um, I'd love to give the, the one answer. I think that there's still some investigation to do. And as time goes on, I think we're going to get more and more information on that. Okay, good one here. What should we tend to? 
to invest into management of control through more sophisticated reporting and controlling mechanisms or more towards the trust-based management? Um, I, I'm a big believer in, uh, in you need to measure it to manage it. Um, I think there's going to be a level of trust that has to be there. Uh, I totally agree with that. Um, but I think that you're, um, the trust is what you're going to have to live with until you can actually manage and uh, measure it. Um, uh, I'm not naive enough to say that I could click my fingers and I'm going to have a, a huge amount of technology um, implemented straight away to give me all of the measures and managers uh, and management that I need. Um, so I would long term be looking at having some control mechanisms in place in terms of measurements. Um, and short term, be looking at how we can use trust, but um, is it, trust is a two-way uh, system. So <laughs> I think that's uh, that's clear. Okay, um, if a complete change will occur on existing team that will give us an entirely new uh, role to them instead of their, their usual job description, What's the best practice to manage this? No peers are doing such roles currently. Yeah. So the first thing that um, I would say to you is that you, you know, I would refer to COPC standard um, items 3.1, and um, which is defining the job, which is look at the skills that they, they require. Um, what is, if you're saying they're doing a different job, um, then what are the skills that are needed? But more importantly, on top of that, is actually looking at the profile of the individual, which would be covered in 3.2 of the COPC standard, which is actually looking at the, the, um, the minimum requirements to hire. If you were going to design a minimum requirements to hire, what would it look like? What sort of profile would the, the staff member have? Remember I said not everyone is suited to working at home. So what would a good working at home person look like in terms of their skills and their profile? Then you can evaluate which staff that you have right now through verification methods to see which ones fit that requirements. Some of it will be profile issues and then you've got to decide what you're going to do, whether or not they're best to work from the office and, um, or trying to develop those skills or do different models for supporting those staff. Um, if, they're, <clears throat> if they're not, if it's a knowledge pace, uh, a knowledge element or a skill element, then you've got the opportunity to de define the training needs for that individual to do this new role. And um, what I would suggest is that most um, organizations we're working with who have transitioned to work at home, it's more the profile that you need to understand of what good looks like um, uh, uh, for working at home agents rather than a skill. But if there's any changes in skills, then you would identify those and, and either re-verify or retrain people or train people on those new skills? Um, this is a, a similar question, um, Kevin, on the same subject anyway, but slightly differently put. Is there, a risk about, is there a risk about the knowledge of the employees who are working at home? Since they'll lose the sort of side-by-side -side chats that they, between uh, employees, uh, chats during uh, coffee breaks, uh, and uh, how they share, um, how, how they can share ideas? Well, I think that coming back to having solutions where you can have the team meetings to, to raise ideas and get, you know, as a group in the, uh, every morning or on a regular basis and use the chat room to do that, you can still have that ability to actually have those conversations and it's a different way. Um, but what I would say about knowledge, I'll go back to how strong your knowledge base is for supporting and capturing information and, um, uh, and how you, well you manage change of information. So if you were relying in the past in change, uh, change of knowledge to be someone you know, sticking a piece of paper up and, and occasionally having a little chat with staff to, to see if people understood it, that's not a robust enough process when, it's when we're talking about work at home. You need to make sure that you have a real robust, strong change management process for your changing of knowledge and, uh, and then verifying how people understand that knowledge. So there's two sides, there's the change of knowledge piece, and then there is um, also the capturing of best practices and sharing of best practices. One is trying to make sure that we have a strong process and strong knowledge base to support us. And then the, the other one is trying to encourage people to raise best practices in the groups, or even through um, online tools or within the knowledge base, um, which can be then evaluated and shared within the bigger group. <clears throat> 